Hi Jean, I'm single, I have a partner. Would it be better tax-wise to get married? Well, I get interviewed quite often by the media and uh, television for single people. I'm kind of known as the singles expert for widows, widowers, and divorcees. So a lot of people have questions on what they should do. Should they get married again? Um, what's the best way to handle if they have somebody that they love? So there's a lot of things you need to think about. If you're involved in a relationship with someone you care very much for and they have children and perhaps you have children too, there's going to be an issue there when one of you gets sick or passes away. Um, we know the issues will be there, so it's best to handle them ahead of time. What you want to do is have a power of attorney drawn up. Now some people like to name, especially single people, like to name uh, their most responsible child to make those financial and health care decisions for them. But what if your children live in another state, which is often the case here in Florida, then maybe you have a partner you love and trust to make those decisions for you. Maybe that's a better choice. You'll know better than me. But a lot of people I meet with say, I don't really know if my child understands what I want health-wise, financial-wise, could I trust them? Or maybe I can trust my child, but I don't trust who they're married to. So it's a good idea to, to give that some thought as you're spending time with your loved one and think about, hey, would they be the best person to make a financial or medical decision for me? And of course, we're talking about decisions while you're alive. A power of attorney is a document that's good while you're living. So perhaps you're incapacitated, you can't remember your name, you got hit on the head, you don't, you're not thinking clearly. Could be a temporary or a permanent pos uh, situation like uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's that are not gonna go away. And um, th that's when your power of attorney takes effect. You wanna be careful with this document. Reason why is you could have somebody that you really trust to make those decisions, but things could change, for example, I remember hearing a, a story about two sisters who had lost their husbands and they were elderly widows and they only had each other and they had no children. So each one named the other for her power of attorney. Well, then they had a fight. And a lot of people do this. They have a disagreement or a, a, a fight with a sibling. And these documents were not updated. Well, the one sister got sick. The other sister said, I'm going to get you. And she took her power of attorney all around town, emptying bank accounts. And probably the most egregious thing she did was fill out a credit card application in her sister's name. She could do that legally with her power of attorney. She charged up $60,000 in credit card debt, and she didn't even have to pay it back. So I talk about this in the seminar and say, well, how do you cancel a power of attorney if you've given the power to somebody that you don't like anymore? And uh, funny enough, I had someone stand up at that moment in time and said, I know how to stop or shoot her. So, you know, perhaps this lady felt that way about her sister, but we don't want to take it to those extremes. So one of the best things you can do, just to keep everybody uh, honest, if you will, is you can name or, or have a triggering event in your power of attorney. We call that a springing power of attorney. So something has to occur for uh, that document to be able to be used. Uh, in other words, let's say, uh, uh, two doctors have to agree that you're incapacitated. That's a good one because you don't want someone getting upset and taking you to their doctor and having you declared incompetent when you're really not. So if you have two doctors uh, uh, that have to agree, this will help protect you. Um, uh, other triggering events could be uh, mentioned in the, in the power of attorney. And one of the mistakes that clients typically make is they think about this ahead of time and they're they're wondering how to prevent one child or one person from taking advantage of them so they name two people to have to agree. That's not really a good idea especially if they're your two children who maybe have some sibling rivalries. I mean I love my brothers but I don't know if I could get along with them when it came to my parents. So you don't want to really name two children there. You know perhaps um, your sister and a, and a child might be alright but make sure if you're going to name two that those people actually like each other and get along 
along. You know, I mean, you can like somebody and get along, but when money's involved, everything changes. So in my opinion, I think you, you should just have one person named there. You can always have an alternate, uh, but you don't really want to have two that have to agree, and you want to have a triggering event there so that it can't just take effect at, at random. So that's a good idea. If you decide to name your live-in partner maybe as an alternate, you name a child that way if your, your partner and you are in an accident together, you know, and it's typical for your partner to have his or her own power of attorney document as well. Uh, also, I would say establish a living will. Now, one of the um, uh, media articles written about this is uh, three financial protections for live-in partners. Investing Answers interviewed me in June and asked me about some things that, that are important for live-ins who are probably not planning on getting married. Of course, a living will is going to be very important. That's going to state your wishes. Um, it also, in certain documents, you can name a person to be the decision maker. You know, a lot of people have trouble naming a child to make this decision because maybe their child won't pull the plug or maybe their child might pull the plug too soon. So that's where you might want to name your live-in partner. The living will is important because none of us that I've ever met in 20 years of doing this, I've never met anybody that said, I want to live like Terry Schiavo for 20 years on um, feeding tubes. So we do need to have in writing what it is we want. Uh, you also want to have a transfer on death on all of your assets. Sometimes it's called a payable on death, sometimes it's called a transfer on death, sometimes it's called in trust for, it does not mean a living trust. In trust for is just a way to put a beneficiary on your assets. So in Florida here you can have beneficiaries or transfer on deaths on everything, including your real estate. Now the beauty about that is, let's say you have shacked up, as this article talks about how to shack up successfully in your senior years, you don't want to get married again, but you've shacked up with somebody, what's the best way to handle that? Well, the best way to handle that, if you really love that partner, and you don't want your kids or their kids to kick one of you out, then you need something in writing giving that person a life estate to your property. What that means is he or she could live in your home uh, as long as they want. They couldn't get kicked out, but the home ultimately belongs to your children. Say it was your home, he moved in, and you die. You could have something uh, set up ahead of time, allows your partner to stay in there as long as he wants. And then when he moves out, sells or moves out or dies, then the home goes to your children. So that protects your loved one from being kind of kicked out, which we see that happen a lot. So you want to make sure you put something in writing about that. Um, also, you can put beneficiaries basically on everything you want, bank accounts, CDs, savings bonds. The reason this is important is without a beneficiary, it's going to go to probate. Now, a lot of people set up a revocable living trust. That means it's changeable. You can change what it says. You can change beneficiaries. You can add things. Of course, every time you do that, you need an attorney and you have to spend a lot of money. One of the things I see a lot of times people try to save money so they hand write in their changes on their revocable living trust. That's a problem. You're opening that trust up for contestment when you do that. Might be better for you to do away with the document completely. If you don't have a five million dollar or more estate, you can basically just put beneficiaries on everything. And then you don't need a trust. You can change the beneficiaries. You can uh, revoke it, you know, do whatever you want without needing an attorney to do that. Yesterday I got asked a question by a lady who came in. She had this trust document. She'd written changes and it was a big mess. It didn't say what she wanted. It said all this crazy stuff and she had never really read it until recently and she says, so well, how do I get rid of this stupid thing? I don't have five million dollars. I said, put it in the shredder. There's no record of that document. You put it in the shredder and then if there's any assets titled in your trust, we have to take them out and put beneficiaries on them. Now, I'm not an attorney, but I've worked with enough attorneys over 20 years that I'm passing along information to you that they have told me and that I've experienced with clients passing away and settling estates. So you might want to read the book called Living Trust, Living Hell. What it tells you is that trusts create more problems than they solve. 
solve in most cases. So if you don't have a $5 million or more estate, you might want to just handle everything with beneficiaries. The attorneys don't like that because they don't get paid and they're bypassed. That beneficiary bypasses probate. It, it keeps you from needing an attorney. It keeps your family from needing an attorney. Everything can be done very simple, uh, simple and handled very simply. Um, another thing that we do for especially our single clients, I want to show you this book that we've put together. Um, one of the um, interviews that I did earlier this year with Bankrate, um, I had mentioned to the reporter that my mother's pocketbook had been stolen out of her car. And she'd just come back from this trip and she had her passport in there and she had all her credit cards in there and she had her checkbook and my mother's going to be 86. So this was a very traumatic situation for her. It was somewhat resolved by the fact that we had put a book together um, with all of this information in it so that when she lost the purse and had the thief steal everything, she was able to go and still you know, get things done, handled professionally and, and quickly and expeditiously before her um, identity was stolen. So they wrote an article in Bankrate.com June 12th of this year, Organizing Your Retirement, talks about the book that we do. We do this for our clients, especially our single ones, it's very important. And it basically is unassuming. You could have this on the countertop and nobody would know it was your important information, but it's a grab and go type thing. So if there's a tornado, a hurricane, a storm, um, or you just need to leave town and you don't want to take all your files, you can grab this and go. And it has all of your information in here, financial information, contacts, you know, it's important. What if you get sick and the lawn man doesn't come because you haven't paid the bill? So it's got the lawn man's name, it's got your contractor's name and all the important people, your house keeper and whatnot. Um, this is important. Uh, the other part of it that's vital is that we put it on a disk, a password protected disk. That's so you could just take the disk and go. You don't have to take the whole book or you could give the disk to your children. Now imagine most of them are raising families and whatnot. They don't have time all the time to get down here right away with that disk. They can get online with your password and they can do whatever kind of information, uh, banking, that kind of stuff, power of attorney. They can pull that up if they need to send that to the doctor's office or the hospital so it makes it convenient for your family. It's especially convenient when you die. Now we don't want you to die, but when that time comes then they can easily take your disc, settle your state, and never have to step, step foot in Florida if necessary. Even with a transfer on death on your property, all they have to do is mail a death certificate to the county. The county will retitle that property into their name. There's no tax, no delay, no cost, no probate very simple. So this is something we do for our clients. We don't want you to have to use an attorney when you don't have to, but sometimes in certain cases they are a necessary evil. One of those cases are when you have a larger estate. So most of my clients over the years have a, between $500,000 and a million dollars, somewhere in that neighborhood. Some have less, some have more. But all of those people need those same types of protections, especially when you're single. So I would say go to my websites, which are www.jean, which is my name, Jean Ann, A-N-N, -N, and my last name, Dorrell, D as in David, O-R-R-E-L-L.com, or you can go to seniorchoices.tv. And either one of those have all the media articles that I've done talking about single people and otherwise and you can download those print them out people like to get the shack up article they like to read the three financial protections for live-in partners and the four biggest mistakes um, that single people make with their finances so that's also on there there's several on there we hope we can help you and hope this will help make your life a lot simpler to keep an eye out for my singles workshops I'm the only one in and around the villages who does widow widowers and single retiree workshops we do about four a year we'll be starting again in January 2012 hope to see you then thank you I try to treat you like I would my own parents. My mother's 85. She's worked hard her whole life as a teacher, and I don't want her to run out of money. So I have her money protected. She can't lose it. She gets tax-free income, and she'll never run out of money no matter how long she lives. If you like that, maybe I can help you too. Jean came up with uh, some suggestions and a plan for me. 
We've managed to maintain everything that we had invested, so we're happy. Now we feel that we're uh, pretty well protected. We're very impressed with the knowledge and information that Jean shared with us, and we made an appointment to talk to her. Whoever is out there looking for a financial planner, you better consider this person. If I had not gone with Jean, I would have lost something like $60,000.